so you know this this takes me into you know exactly what do the chinese have i thought i'd just share a, a little bit about what china has uh because it's directly relevant to these patents because as a as i mentioned uh the the uh the us navy is aware that the chinese have similar technologies to uh what the navy uh has has been developing and the patent applications are, are really done to make public or to bring into the white world technologies that were built in the black world uh, 30 to 40 years ago, going back to the two, uh, back going back to the 1970s. On November 20, 2019, newly retired, a newly retired uh, US Air Force General, Stephen Quast, publicly declared that China is building a space navy with battleships and destroyers that, be could, that could be used against US military assets in space. So in 2019, you actually have people in the Air Force being given the, the kind of green light to go public and start spilling the beans on the Navy's, so on, the chi on China's secret space program. Um, and, and it's interesting, the, f the term he used. He didn't, he didn't say, well, China is developing advanced satellites and uh, uh, spacecraft, uh, you know, spa uh, moon landers or moon orbiters or, or kind of orb uh, orbiters or orbital vehicles for Mars and so forth. He's talking about battleships, quote, battleships and destroyers. So he's telling us that the Chinese have battleships and destroyers out there. Or well, they're working on them, and 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 what, and the subtext of this is that we also have battleships and crew and destroyers out there. And of course, you know, for those of you that have read my books, know that I've been talking about the Navy having battleships and destroyers uh, out in space that the, that were first deployed in the late 1970s and early 1980s. So basically, uh, the Chinese are playing catch up. Uh, but the air, but this Air Force General is is getting us all up to speed that this is what lies ahead for us all, that we are entering into this new world, where it's not just going to be a matter of oh you know the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans have you know uh, satellites and have moon orbiters and moon landers or Mars orbiters and Mars landers no, uh, the US Russia China. We have battleship, space battleships out there, space destroyers out there, space carriers out there. This is what uh, William Tompkins has been telling has been telling us and others. So, how did China develop a secret space program? Uh, Boyd Bushman, who uh, worked at, for Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works, says, "Quote." I don't want to us to fall behind the Russians and Chinese. And the problem I have is that Area 51 is working with both the Russians and Chinese right now, trying to make UFOs. So he said that back in 2017. And the thing is, he learned about this when he was working at Lockheed Martin. And, and this began um, in the two so this began in the 1980s. And in the 90s, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, China and Russia began working uh, with the US Air Force and Navy out of Area 51 facilities working on reverse engineering some of the UFOs that they had gotten their hands on. So I discuss all of this in the book Rise of the Red Dragon, the new book that's coming out. Um, and, and, that's, and that's where I go into great detail into China's secret space program and, and, and how it uh, has developed these kinds of technologies that the Navy patents are telling us about now. That the Navy uh, developed these technologies in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, China learned about this through industrial espionage and has been developing it recently in the last uh, two decades. And, and this is why the Navy is, is white worlding these technologies because there's no national security reason to keep these technologies secret anymore. So in a way, uh, China, through its own kind of like industrial espionage and reverse engineering of 
uh, these US secret space program technologies has, ex has accelerated the disclosure project, uh, the disclosure process. So this takes us now to the third Navy patent, which is published in 2017. Um, and that's, a, uh, that's generating gravity waves for propulsion. So again, it's, uh, here's the patent number. Uh, it's a, the inventor was Salvador Payes. Here you have assigned to the Navy. It tells you the application was filed in um, February 2017. It was assigned to the Department of the Navy and it was published in, in 2018 in August and, um, and then it was granted in June of 2019. So this is um, a device for generating gravity waves for propulsion. Um, so here's, the, here's what the abstract says. So I'll read that out. <clears throat> a high frequency gravitational wave generator, including a gas filled shell with an outer, <coughs> outer shell surface, microwave emitters, sound generators, and acoustic vibration resonant gas filled cavities. So it's telling us about the, the kind of internal Internal, internal mechanisms of the craft. So, you know, this is how the craft looks. And so you have a cavity, an outer shell, and an inner shell. Um, and, and inside it, you have these acoustic devices. Uh, so basically, it's telling us that inside of this outer shell and the inner shell, you have electromagnetic fields being pulsed. Uh, it's like a microwave cavity. So here you have like the microwave emitters, here 400, here 400, the microwave emitters, that is emitting microwaves around the outer shell. Just as in the hybrid aircraft craft, you had the, the same principle. So you have uh, the shell, outer shell, inner shell, and so you have a cavity, and so you have the pulsing of microwaves developing an electromagnetic field. And also you have this acoustic device that's also generating an electromagnetic field. So I'll go back to the um, abstract and it, it tells us the outer shell surface is electrically charged and vibrated by the microwave emitters to generate a first electromagnetic field. Okay, so that's the first field. It's being generated outside of the craft. The acoustic vibration resonant gas field cavities each have a cavity surface that can be electrically charged and vibrated by acoustic energy from the sound generators such that a second electromagnetic field is generated. So what that means is that internally here, you, you, have, you, know, you, you have this kind of gas field shell. So this, it's filled with the shell and you have a sound generator. So this, this device is, is uh, uh, the, the sound generator, that's uh, 200. That's the 200 here. So this is the this is the sound generator. Um, and, and that generates an electromagnetic magnetic field uh, that is a, it's a second field. So basically what you're having here is uh, uh, a second electromagnetic field that is being generated uh, by these acoustic devices using sound. So you, have, so you have a sound generator here, this triangle and this triangle, a sound generator that generates a sound and also generates an electromagnetic field. And you also have an electromagnetic field being generated by these microwave emitters um, kind of just between the, the, the inner hull and the outer hull or the inner shell and the outer, outer shell of the craft. And so those two electromagnetic fields are able to generate an effect which is, um, uh, a gra which is generating a gravitational field. So basically what you have is two electromagnetic fields and if you pulse them and, and, and move them around in a certain way, you can generate a gravity wave. Uh, so it's, it's like, um, 
uh, this this gravity wave is something that can mean that uh, you, you can have uh, gravity changing or another way of looking at that is uh, another way uh, some people may have heard of an Alcoberry warp drive and uh, that's where kind of like space in front of the craft is compressed or space time in front of the craft is compressed and space time behind the craft is expanded which means that the craft can move very very quickly in space time to the location that you want so it's kind of like a warp drive so this is something something uh, something very similar uh, that you're you're generating a gravity wave by uh, pulsing and modulating two electromagnetic fields one generated by a microwave device and the other generated by a sound device so that's kind of like my layman's explanation for that hopefully that makes sense um, but you know it's very significant that uh, uh, Salvador Payes was able to have a paper published on this uh, a high frequency gravitational wave induced propulsion um, published for the Society of Automobile Engineers Technical International uh, papers so that was published in 2017 of course the paper was was published in um, June of 2018 so that's showing that you know the navy is wanting payes to not only have these pay uh, these patents published through the patent system but he's also wanting him to have uh scholarly papers de delivered uh at different scientific conventions and, and and that's basically so the navy wants payes to go forward and basically introduce white world scientists and engineers to the feasibility of these technologies so so they want scientists and engineers to learn about this uh, uh, because this is something that is socially or globally transformative so so the navy wants to do this but there are challenges in doing this and and i'll talk a little bit more about that but 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 certainly um a lot of scientists, a lot of engineers, you know, they, they operate under, um, uh, earlier on I mentioned conservation of energy laws and, and, they, and they look at this, uh, they look at this kind of device uh, or maybe we go back to, to the earlier device, yeah, to this device where, you know, you're talking about a hybrid aerospace underwater craft that is being generated by, uh, uh, an electromagnetic uh, that by a quantum bubble that is being generated in front of the craft and that uh, you have an electromagnetic field a, a microwave wave being generated a lot of scientists and engineers look at this and they say well this is impossible how can this be done so it's just as the patent examiner rejected this and said well you know how can you how can you, where's the power come from for this how can you generate this power um a lot of scientists will look at that and say well there's nothing in existence that could generate the power for for this kind of hybrid aerospace underwater craft um of course the patent uh, examiner overturned his rejection because of these uh uh but because of the the letter by uh dr james she from the naval aviation enterprise the chief technical officer but a lot of scientists say that well this stuff isn't isn't possible how can you do this so this is where these scholarly papers come in it's to really kind of like break the ice it's really to like tell these scientists you know this stuff is feasible start looking at it you know kind of get out of your rigid mindset um get out of your ideas that you know um the kind of power sources for these kinds of electromagnetic magnetic fields being generated doesn't exist um and and just like open your minds because the power sources do exist and will and i will be talking about this so this is a part of the reason why all of this stuff is coming out and being pushed so now we get into a fourth patent application uh in 2019 this is for a room temperature superconductor um, so it's a the patent application is, is titled piezo electricity induced high temperature superconductor 
Um, it uh, was uh, the inventor Salvador Payas. Uh, again, Department of the Navy. Uh, the patent application uh, was filed in June of 2017. Uh, it was published uh, in November of 2019. Um, and application status is pending. So, uh, and I just checked the application status is still pending. And I'll, and, and I'll I will explain why that's why that's the case. So what is a room temperature superconductor? So a, a, a room temperature superconductor is a material that is capable of exhibiting superconductivity at operating temperatures of or above 25 degrees Celsius. That's approximately 300 degrees Kelvin. Uh, so room temperature, room temperature superconductivity in a manipulated current carrying special composite metal wire may be achieved. So this is in the uh, patent uh, application by P.S. and he's explaining how this, how this works. Uh, and, and basically a uh, superconductor is a metal such as say gold, aluminium, lead, uh, which when the temperature is low enough, uh, you know, roughly, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, when, when the, basically what, what happens with a, a superconductor uh, in, in, in the conventional world, when, when you actually have a superconductor like uh, gold, aluminium, lead, um, at, at the critical temperature, what, what happens is that uh, it is able to uh, experience zero resistance. So it doesn't lose any electrical energy uh, in terms of heat or gravity, or sorry, heat or uh, waste. So in other words, a, a superconductor uh, is a great way of being able to store electrical energy because you're not going to have any loss because of heat and electrical resistance and so forth. So uh, I will talk a little bit more about the difference between uh, uh, a superconductor and a normal conductor metal later. So I'll go on. The current must be pulsed for maximum effect. This concept enables the transmission of electrical power without any losses and exhibits optimal thermal management, no heat dissipation, which leads to the design and development of novel energy generation and harvesting devices with enormous benefits to civilization." End quote. So what Payas is telling us here is that this room temperature superconductor can be achieved uh, by basically uh, manipulating uh, electrical energy uh, that's being uh, moved around a particular metal uh, or, a, or a composite metal wire in a particular way. That if you're able to manipulate the currents that are moving in there uh, in a particular way, uh, then you're able to influence the superconductivity super of that metal as, as opposed to the conventional open source scientific world, you know, their, their, their approach is to uh, find metals <coughs> that are, <coughs> that can be, uh, that, that, that are suitable superconductors when the temperature is lowered to a critical temperature, you know, which is like maybe uh, like minus uh, 200 degrees uh, centigrade which obviously is a very hard thing to do. You have to do it in a laboratory. But, um, and, and then, you know, when you do that, uh, in, in a facility, you can lower the temperature to like minus 200 degrees uh, uh, centigrade. Um, and, and you can use a metal, you know, the, the right metal, whatever its critical temperature is, uh, it becomes a superconductor. So it can hold electrical energy and not lose anything uh, to heat, you know, but the but the practical implication are very limited because you know 200 degrees below zero, 
uh, you, you have to put a lot of energy into developing something like that. You have to develop, you know, have to develop, say, uh, a facility that can lower the temperature to minus 200 degrees, and then you have the metals uh, that are lowered to that, and then you can that can hold the the high voltages that are necessary uh, to to store energy. So that's going to be very expensive, very difficult, and very large. But what Payes is doing is that he's saying that his superconductor, his room temperature superconductor, can operate at a, of or above 25 degrees Celsius. So, so that would mean if you're kind of like if you're needing to store energy uh, using superconductors, say on a ship or a spacecraft, um, you know, on one way to do it would be to to build a, a facility or a room uh, that is lowered in temperature to say you know minus 200 degrees. And, and then you have your superconductors in there and they can hold electrical energy and not lose any electrical energy to heat and so forth. Um, and sure, that would be one way to store a, a large amount of electrical energy, but because you have to heat that room or keep that room at minus 200 degrees, you're going to use a lot of power to do that. But if all you need is a room that can be heated that, that has to be at like 25 degrees Celsius, you're going to save a lot of power. This is going to be really efficient. And this is like the, you know, the holy grail of uh, superconductivity. And Pais is saying that all you need to do is not concentrate on the metals, uh, not concentrate on finding the critical temperature for a, super, or, or for a, for a particular metal. You just, you just configure metals with these uh, wires uh, that can be manipulated in a in a way so that you can experience superconductivity at 25 degrees Celsius and above, which for a lot of scientists is like that's not possible. It's you know again this is like the mindset is like yeah you know, they they can't think outside of the box because they're thinking how can this be done? They don't understand uh, the incredible implications of uh, electromagnetic energy and and how it can do things like influence gravity, uh, influence propulsion, and even influence things like superconductivity. Uh, uh, you know, and there's a kind of like, you know, there's a whole story behind that in terms of Maxwell's equations in the, in the late 1800s and how Maxwell um, talked about combining electro, electrical and magnetic energies uh, with his equations. But yet, you know, when it comes to things like uh, gravity and force, Newtonian force and so forth, uh, you know, the, the, the equations were never unified. Uh, so, you know, we are talking about kind of unified field equations and uh, that's, that's where we're going. I, I'm not going to be able to kind of talk at that. I, I, I don't have the kind of expertise, but this is really where we need to kind of like, this is what's needed to understand the full capability of these technologies. And, uh, uh, and, and that's what Payes is trying to do to open the scientific community to this. So, okay, so what's the difference between a conductor and a superconductor? Uh, so you know, here's an explanation from the electrical uh, technology uh, website. Uh, the main difference is, uh, is that a superconductor has zero electrical resistance while conductors have some finite resistance. The superconductor is actually a special type of conductor that achieves superconductivity only when its temp temperature is brought down below critical temperature. So, you know, if you have, say, a, a conductor like, say, copper, right? So copper is a good conductor. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 say, it is able to... Uh, conducted electrical energy, but lose some, you, it loses some energy to heat. So, you know, electrical wires, copper wires, you know, they, they heat up and they, they lose energy uh, to heat. So it's a conductor rather than a superconductor, but, you know, copper is a good conductor. Uh, but copper, uh, if, if you lower the temperature of copper, it'll, it'll behave, it'll be able to lose less energy uh, it'll be able to hold more electrical energy. And so there are certain metal, metals, uh, as I mentioned, aluminium, uh, uh, gold, even lead, uh, that when you reduce the temperature down to kind of like minus 200 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit, whatever, whatever its critical temperature is, it'll behave like a superconductor. And superconductors, you know, uh, they neutralize the magnetic field, and so they float. 
that's why you have this kind of like uh, what looks like a chunk of, of metal, whatever that is, uh, floating. Uh, so, so that's the difference between a conductor and a superconductor. Uh, conductors lose electrical energy, uh, whereas superconductors don't. But the problem with a superconductor is that it only becomes a superconductor at very, very low energies, minus 200, 200 degrees centigrade and so forth, whatever it is. Uh, but if Pais is correct, with, well, with Pais's invention, you can a able to kind of like change that uh, and, and have the, uh, and, and have any, any particular metal, once you have uh, wires configured around that, that's generating uh, electric magnetic fields or manipulating those fields, so it becomes a superconductor. So you can turn something like copper, copper wiring, you know, if it's generating electromagnetic, if you have uh, electromagnetic fields being pulsed and, 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 uh, and, and being maneuvered around it in a certain way, it can behave as a superconductor at room temperatures, 25 degrees or so. So that's re revolutionary. So once again, uh, Pais's patent was rejected. Uh, the room temperature superconductor patent was rejected under uh, 35 uh, un, under the US code because the examiner determined, quote, the disclosed invention is inoperative and therefore lacks utility, end quote. And that no assertions of room temperature superconductivity have currently been recognized or verified by the scientific community. So that's Brett Tingley kind of explaining why it was that the Pais's patent for this room temperature superconductor was rejected. So once again, it's that kind of like uh, conventional mindset uh, where uh, being able to manipulate uh, electromagnetic energies uh, for displaying these extraordinary capabilities such as uh, propulsion or in, in the case of like uh, protecting uh, an area from attacks or uh, you know, quantum vacuum bubbles or in this case, being able to convert a conductor like aluminium or lead or gold into something that is an effective superconductor because you have wire uh, manipulating electrical energy around it, that that's not possible, that there's no scientific literature talks about that. So the patent application was rejected. So once again, you actually have uh, the Chief Technical Officer for the Naval Aviation Enterprise, uh, Dr. James Sheen Inovini, writing a letter of support. So this is the second time, and it's a second examiner. So this is two different examiners who have rejected Pace's patents. Uh, the first examiner eventually overturned it and granted it to, that was to the hybrid aerospace underwater craft. So this second examiner um, is reviewing the uh, room temperature superconductor. And now he gets this letter from Dame James Shi saying, I am familiar with the above referenced patent application and related amendment, as well as the development, usage and properties of the piezoelectricity induced room temperature superconductor, superconductor. That the invention described in the above referenced patent application is operable and enabled via the physics described in the patent exact application and the peer reviewed paper described in the inventor amendment. So that's telling us that after Payes had responded to the patent examiner's request for more information and, and amending the patent application, which Payes did, and the patent examiner nevertheless rejected the patent, that the uh, James She intervened again and basically made the case that uh, this is operable and enabled via the physics described by the patent application. So Ben again saying that this kind of technology is operable, is being worked on, and, and that the peer reviewed papers uh, actually do discuss various aspects of it. Uh, but doing it in a way that, which wasn't telling the examiner, you know, you're a dummy, you don't realize uh, that this patent, that this peer reviewed papers out there that, that say why this uh, uh, invention 
uh, is possible that it was just like, well, you, you hadn't looked at some of these uh, peer-reviewed papers that explain how this patent application could work. So it was phrased diplomatically, but nevertheless, it sh was showing that white world scientists just don't get it often. Um, and they need to be kind of like pointed in the right direction. Okay, so now we get to the fifth US Navy patent. Oh, sorry, uh, let me just give you an update on this. Um, I've, I've been following uh, the developments of this patent. Uh, for those of you that are interested, you can see down here that um, in, uh, in, in September of 2009, the application was still, pen was still pending. Well, I just checked and the application is still pending. So that means that uh, the patent examiner is still reviewing uh, that letter from uh, James Shee and trying to decide what to do. Because as far as the patent examiner is concerned, this can't work, but yet he's being told by the chief technical, technical officer for the Naval Aviation Enterprise, someone that you just can't ignore, that it does work. So he's kind of like, you know, caught between a rock and a hard place and trying to decide what to do. This takes us to the fifth and final patent application by Payas, which uh, really, in a way, is probably the most important. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, nuclear fusion reactor. Uh, and the patent is called Plasma Compression Fusion Device. Uh, again, uh, Salvador Payas is the inventor, assigned to the US Navy. Uh, priority, uh, sorry, uh, it was assigned to the Department of the Navy uh, and it was published in uh, September 26, 2019. And as of right now, the publication is still, pun is still pending. So uh, why it's pending, I, th I think it's probably because there's still this to and fro going on between Payas and the patent examiners. Uh, as to whether this stuff is is real, but as 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 we've seen so far, that out of two out of the five patent applications, uh, the patent examiners rejected them, and in both times, uh, the chief technical officer for the Navy, uh, Abel, A, Naval uh, Aviation Enterprise, has intervened. So, what exactly is the um, this nuclear fusion reactor? Again, you have a summary. Uh, by Brett Tingley and Tyler Rugaway from uh, writing for the drive and they said it is claimed in the patent application that this plasma compression fusion device is capable of producing power in the gigawatt that's 1 billion watts to terawatt that's 1 trillion watts range and above with input power only in the kilowatt 1000 watts to megawatt million watts range so that's important because um, he's telling us that essentially this nuclear fusion reactor is an over unity device. Now, remember earlier we talked about over unity. If anything creates more power, more energy than what goes into it, then it's a unit over unity device. So the efficiency of this thing is uh, is looking at that, uh, we're talking about um, at least a thousand times more efficient, uh, a thousand times efficiency. So it's a uh, maximum our, uh, power out output or minimum power output is one gigawatt, whereas the power input that it needs is only a thousand watts. So if you think about that, a thousand watts input and one billion watts output. What, is, what does that work out to? That's, that's, uh, that's 100,000 times the um, efficient, that's 100,000 times efficiency, if I've got that right. My maths might be incorrect there, maybe during the uh, Q&A someone could point out if I'm right, but there you have like, a, 100,000 times efficiency. That's incredible. Definitely, we're talking about an over-unity device. 
By comparison, America's largest nuclear power plant, the Palo Verde nuclear power plant in, in Arizona, generates around 4,000 megawatts, or that's four, gigabyte, uh, four gigawatts. And the A1B nuclear reactors designed for the Navy's General Force class aircraft carriers generate 700 megawatts. So that basically means that this, this device, say at the upper end, uh, this device that uh, this nuclear fusion reactor, uh, at the small end, he's talking about something the size of a basketball, something that can generate one gigawatt. That's the size of a basketball. And it's big enough to generate uh, enough power for the General Ford class aircraft carrier. So that's the small end. And it would only need like a uh, thousand watts as a power supply. So you basically, you, you connect this device. I mean, you, you, you could have just a thousand watts being generated by uh, some device. And, and then, then once you reach ignition, then the whole thing continues to power itself. Uh, but just to get it going, you need a thousand watts, and then it's going to uh, be generating uh, one gigawatt. But of course, that's the basketball size version. For a larger version, and, and Payas says that these things can be scaled, you're going to be generating up to one terawatt. And that's a terawatt is like, um, what, what is it? Uh, four gigawatts is the, is the, is the largest nuclear reactor in the United States. So you're talking about something that's uh, 250 times more powerful than the, than the world, than the, than America's largest nuclear reactor. Uh, the world's largest nuclear reactor is in uh, Japan that generates eight gigawatts, but even that pales in the comparison with this kind of nuclear fusion reactor. So when was the first nuclear fusion reactor Build. I mean, is a uh, built? Is this a is this a new thing? I mean, as I was saying earlier, that this is technology that's not new. The Navy is not releasing through the patent system new technology. This is old technology, and and I mentioned earlier uh, the 1970s and 1980s was when the Navy was uh, producing these kinds of uh, technologies for its secret space program. Well, we know that this is actually pretty close to how things. Uh, played out in terms of the timeline. Uh, David Adair claims that in, he's a, a whistleblower and insider, claims that in 1971, he was taken to Area 51, where he saw a truck-sized version of his prototype electromagnetic fusion containment en engine. And he says that he, he developed, he, he developed his uh, small-scale version with the help of uh, the US Air Force because his patron was uh, General Curtis LeMay, the former Chief of Staff of the US Air Force. Basically, LeMay sponsored uh, Adair, who was 17 at the time, who was a personal friend of the family. And, and he saw Adair as a genius. And it turns out that Adair had built a miniature nuclear fusion rocket or engine that was very similar to a truck sized version that had been recovered from a crash extraterrestrial craft that was being held at Area 51. So uh, the Air Force arranged for Adair to build his device to make sure it was feasible and that it worked. And when it did work, uh, Adair goes to Area 51 where, the, where his device was targeted and he says he was then taken under Area 51, where he saw a truck-sized version of his nuclear fusion reactor. So right there, you, you're being told that in 1971, this is when, when it happened, that in 1971, the Air Force sponsored a 17-year-old and was there all along the way in helping him build a miniature nuclear fusion reactor that was the that was kind of like a miniature version of this larger nuclear fusion reactor used on an extraterrestrial spacecraft that had crashed and was being studied at Area 51 
and was being reverse engineered. So that was in 1971. Okay, so right there, the Air Force and the Navy, since the early 1970s, have known about nuclear fusion devices, reactors, and have been building them for their craft, for the craft that the Navy eventually deployed in deep space, in their space battle groups. And now, after 40 years, this, this technology is being uh, released through the patent system. And in the 1970s, uh, uh, William Tompkins talked about Nautilus class nuclear attack submarines being retrofitted with these, uh, being retrofitted so that they, be, they were converted from uh, some uh, underwater craft into space growing craft. And he, and he described uh, the exotic propulsion and energy systems for the deployment in outer space. Um, obviously, with a Nautilus class nuclear attack submarine, you have, the, you have a nuclear fission action uh, engine, but that doesn't give you enough power to be able to propel a spacecraft or to develop the electromagnetic fields that Salvador Payes has introduced us to that could propel, you, propel your craft into space. What you need is a, a, a very large power supply, and that's where the nuclear fusion reactor comes in. So now, now we get the timetable, we get the idea, okay, it was in the 70s, that's when the Navy and the Air Force start building these nuclear fusion reactors, uh, the, in the, in, and the Air Force starts using them for its secret space program, the Navy starts using it for its secret space program, and the Navy uses these nuclear uh, class, these Nautilus class nuclear attack submarines as prototype spacecraft, um, and they retrofit them so that they could basically be flown out into space. So, you know, I talk about that in that particular article um, on my website, US Navy patent for nuclear fusion reactor supports claims of mile long space carriers. So this tells us, okay, so we know from what Corey Gord, William Tompkins, Gary McKinnon and other insiders have been revealing, that the Navy has these miles long space carriers. Well, the question is, what powers them? Well, now we know. It's these nuclear fusion reactors that can generate, well, you know, the basketball size version can generate one gigawatt, which is, what, which is still much more than the power supply in uh, the Ford class aircraft carriers, which only generate 0.7 gigabytes, that's 700 megawatts. So a basketball sized nuclear fusion reactor could generate one gigawatt. And Payes says that they can be scaled up to generate one terawatt, 1000 gigawatts. And that's the kind of power supply you would need to power a kilometer long spacecraft or mile long spacecraft, like one of these space carriers. You, you, could develop, you, could, you would need one of those or several of those to, uh, to be able to power these kinds of craft to go out into space. So now we know what the nuclear fusion reactors are doing uh, as far as the Navy is concerned and why the Navy is not so concerned about releasing this now. I mean, this is technology that's 40 years old. Who knows, maybe the Navy has developed something that is even far more powerful than a nuclear fusion reactor. Okay, so one of the things that uh, some, some of you might be interested in is, uh, well, uh, are the Navy patents related to the videos of the Tic Tac UFOs that we've been seeing? Okay, well, the first article discussing the Navy pilot sightings of the Tic Tac UFOs was published on May 14, 2015 by Paco Shirichi, or Shirik, Shiriki, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, a former Navy aviator. It was based on a classified Office of Naval Intelligence report. And then the first patent was filed by uh, Payes in July, 2000, uh, July 2015. I mean, those are pretty close. What are the chances of that just being coincidence? That the first article 
and the leaking of a video of this um, Tic Tac UFO that you have this being published in uh, May of 2014 and then only a couple of months later, three months later, you have the first patent and, and again it involves the Navy and interestingly uh, this naval aviator Parkle says that he was given a classified Office of Naval Intelligence report on the 2004 Tic Tac event and that's how he, uh, he used that information in his article. So here you have the Office of Naval Intelligence actually encouraging someone to write up a story about the Tic Tac, uh, getting the information out because the Navy wants people to know. The Navy's ready to kind of like get the public up to speed.